I'm back with another reading recap. If you missed the last one where I reviewed everything I read in January and February, that will be linked in the description box along with all of the other usual links, all the books I mentioned in today's video, discounts, my Goodreads profile, my Amazon wish list, etc. I read 14 books in the last two months, which is a new record for me since getting back into reading. So fingers crossed I can keep that momentum going. March and April were great reading months for me. I have a lot of passionate thoughts about the books I read so I can't wait to share them with you today. One last thing before we dive in, I would really appreciate it if you left me a comment down below letting me know what you're currently reading or if you're not reading anything, a book that is on your radar, but let's get into it. I kicked off March with The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. I feel like I should preface this review by saying, after I raved about The Guest List by Lucy Foley in my year-end book review, a number of people I know have read it based on my recommendation and I don't think a single person who has read it because of me has really enjoyed it. Like I think everyone who has read it has had very average feelings about that book. If you are one of those people then you probably won't like The Paris Apartment either. This is Lucy Foley's newest murder mystery. It's told from multiple different points of view like all of her books are and just like the guest list it features a number of very unlikable characters. So if those are qualities you don't like in a book then steer clear of this one. This story follows Jess who is down on her luck so she decides to crash with her brother Ben in his Paris apartment but when she shows up he is missing and everyone in his building seems like they have something to hide. I enjoyed the pacing of this. I was definitely drawn in to the mystery. I was very engaged the entire time I was reading it so for that reason I gave it four stars. I do feel like Lock Every Door by Riley Sager did a better job with the creepy gothic apartment building atmosphere and I also feel like the guest list surprised me a lot more than this did. And there was one character that should have been way more important for the storyline but they ended up being a little bit pointless like they did serve a purpose in the plot but there was one big loose end that didn't end up going anywhere so that really bothered me. If Lucy Foley's books appeal to you then I would say give the guest list a shot. Once again if you didn't like the guest list though then skip this one. Next I started the Wayward Children series by Sean and McGuire. I've heard fantastic things about this series and I love it so far. These are YA fantasy books which I would never typically gravitate towards which just goes to show that you shouldn't be afraid to step out of your preferred genre. This series centers on Eleanor West's home for wayward children, which is essentially a boarding school for children who have stepped through portals into alternate universes. In book one, you learn about these kids who have had a doorway magically present itself to them and it leads them into a fantasy world where they've had this sense of home and belonging that they've never really had in the real world. And some of these kids are sent back into reality and have issues coping, so then Eleanor West takes them in. I read each of these books in one sitting. I love the characters. I love the dark fairy tale vibes. The fantasy worlds are divided into this kind of like northeast southwest directional system but instead of those directions they are split into wicked or virtuous logical or nonsense, rhyme and reason. It's so interesting. Like the world that exists in this book is just so fascinating. I rated the first book five stars and I gave the second book four stars. The only reason Down Among the Sticks and Bones wasn't a five star read for me was that it focused on the secondary characters from the first book that we learned the most about in this story. So it wasn't a ton of new information but still a delightful read for me nonetheless. I can't wait to continue this series. I'm trying to wait to find them on sale hopefully because hardcover books are really expensive in Canada but I'm dying to read more. I hate to say this but I think after reading Daisy Jones and the Six I have realized that Taylor Jenkins Reid is just not the author for me. This book follows a fictional iconic 1970s rock band and the untold mystery of why they split up at the height of their success. This book is told in the format of interviews and I feel like I need to start off by saying I actually enjoyed that formatting because that's one of the number one things I see people complain about when it comes to this book. That wasn't my issue. In the past I've read a lot of non-fiction memoirs and autobiographies from celebrities in general but more specifically musicians. I love reading about bands in the 1960s to 1990s era because these people have lived the most outrageous lives and I feel like this is a genre where you could really push the boundaries and still have it feel believable so I was really disappointed to see that Taylor Jenkins Reid didn't really take those opportunities 
opportunities. It felt very tame and anticlimactic. Nothing that interesting really happens in this story. I feel like I was just waiting for this explosion, for this big event to take place, and it never came. The opening chapter set my hopes really high because it starts off by telling the story of Daisy when she is a teenager growing up in Los Angeles, sneaking into clubs on the Sunset Strip. It had very almost famous vibes and I was super into that. But for a book called Daisy Jones and the Six, I was expecting Daisy Jones to be a much more important character. I still rated it three stars due to the quick pacing from the interview format. I finished this in two days. If this had a more traditional narrative style and was more descriptive and I really slogged through it, I would have honestly been pissed when I got to the end and I was like, wait, that's it? And this would have been two stars in that case. So the format actually saved it for me a little bit. The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager also let me down a little bit. In my last reading video, I read Home Before Dark and I was like, fingers crossed, my next Riley Sager is going to be my five star read from him. And I'm here to eat my words because this has actually been my least favorite Riley Sager read so far. Take my review with a grain of salt because this has really great ratings and it seems to be a lot of people's favorite Riley Sager, but I just really struggled to get into this one. It didn't have that like immediately gripping effect on me that Home Before Dark and Lock Every Door did. This has the classic 15 years later thriller trope. Teenage Emma goes to summer camp in upstate New York and in the middle of the night her three bunk mates go missing and they have never been seen again. 15 years later, Emma has never been able to let go of her obsession with this case, so when she is presented with the opportunity to go work at this summer camp, she takes it in the hopes that she is going to finally find closure and figure out what happened to those girls. The best part of this book, in my opinion, is the twist at the very end. Like I said with Home Before Dark, Riley Sager does a great job keeping you guessing until the very last page, and this book was no exception. I needed a little romance in my life after a string of thrillers, dark books, and general fiction, so next I decided to read Get a Life, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. First of all, I love that this author is writing romance stories about diverse characters from marginalized identities. The protagonists in this book are a black plus-size chronically ill woman and a white cishet man who was in a physically abusive relationship. I really enjoyed this one. I found their relationship so sweet and charming and the spice was great as well. The one thing I didn't enjoy was that the female lead, Chloe, is terrible at the beginning of the book. Like she does some really messed up things and is a really unlikable person on the surface. So I can see why some people don't like this book because I can easily see how some people wouldn't be able to get past that. And it just didn't really feel necessary. I didn't think she needed to be that nasty to kind of like get the point across that she was going through something. I just found the male main character in this story so precious that I was willing to look past it. Side note, if you read this book and you kept picturing Red as Domino Gleason, let me know because I could not get that image out of my head based on his description. But yeah, I'm definitely going to read more from this series. I've actually heard that the third book seems to be people's favorites, so I will definitely read more. Somehow I ended up reading numerous different books that have recently been turned into TV series or movies in the month of April, and the first book in that category is One of Us is Lying by Karen M. McManus. Five students enter detention and by the end, one of them is dead. This had super compelling writing. It didn't feel too juvenile, and at the same time, it also didn't feel like it was completely out of touch with how teenagers or high schoolers would act, which are some of my main complaints when it comes to the YA novels I've read. This was so close to being five stars, but I did knock it down to four because some of the characters' motives ended up feeling a little bit flimsy, but also teenagers are dramatic as hell. Like, what I have murdered a classmate because they forgot to come to my birthday party in a teenage hormone-induced rage? Maybe. Obviously joking, <laughs> and that's not what happens in the book. But you know, have you met a teenager lately? They are dramatic, so I can't totally fault it for that. I did not like the show, however. I only watched three episodes before I had to give up. I didn't like some of the casting choices, but while I was watching, I was like, oh, this is the Riverdale effect in full force. Like where TV high schools all need to be like super moody and sexy for some reason now. I feel like this would have done so much better as like your average fluorescent lighting high school show. They're in the cafeteria eating lunch. Why is it golden hour? <laughs> also, can someone please let me know, in the US, do teenagers ride motorcycles? 
Like, I would assume the answer is no, but it pops up in media so frequently that I've actually started to wonder, so leave it in the comments. Next is the Book Talk LGBT Romance Classic, the one and the only Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. This is a story about a relationship between the first son of the United States and the prince of the British monarchy. I gave this three stars. There were things I liked about it and things that I didn't. I think this book had some of the best conflict between characters. Casey did a really great job evoking passion and negative emotions. Like this is the only book I have read where the main characters are fighting and I genuinely feel tense. Like at one point I realized I was holding my breath while they're having an argument because I was actually like stressed out for the characters. I kind of had a love-hate relationship with the ideal leftist world that the author has created in this book. Hear me out because I obviously loved this scenario where the US has their first female democratic president, but I also would have liked it to be a bit more realistic. Like yes, it is a romance, so you're guaranteed a happy ending, but that doesn't mean that the characters don't have to face any real world consequences either. Everything just works out a little too well, but I also do see the importance in having queer stories that aren't centered around trauma and do have happy endings. The main thing I hear about this book is how adorable Alex and Henry's relationship is, and I feel like I kept waiting for those like super precious squee moments but they just kind of never came like I just don't feel like I had the intended connection to this couple. I did enjoy their correspondence and all of the references to famous historical love letters but I just felt like there was something I was missing about it and I hate to say this I'm sorry because it makes me sound like such a boomer but I really hated the gratuitous swearing in this book. I know it's part of the character's personality traits like the whole having a filthy mouth thing that comes up in the book numerous times but it really just pulls me out of the book because I don't think the president's chief of staff would be like graphically threatening and swearing at the first children you know I bought migrations by Charlotte McConaughey on a whim because I saw so many booktubers include it in their 2021 favorites and wow am I glad I did this book is set in a very painful timeline where mass extinction due to climate change is the reality we're living in. This story follows a woman named Franny who finagles her way onto a fishing boat to follow what is suspected to be the final migration of arctic turtles from Greenland to Antarctica. Gorgeous prose, the most intriguing diverse cast of characters. There's this thread of mystery woven through it and a story that is just so heart-wrenching in so many different ways. I would recommend reading the trigger warnings for this but definitely a book I would recommend to anyone and everyone as long as you're okay with the triggering content. Joining the online book space has added an unexpected dynamic to my reading. When I was a kid and I would read I chose my books on my own and I never really heard anyone else's thoughts on the books I read. So now when I pick up a book and I go on Goodreads and I see that every person I know who has read this book has rated it four or five stars, it feels weird when I'm the only person who gave it a low rating and that is exactly what happened with Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. This is the second book that I read and then watched the series adaptation and in this case it is the exact opposite experience to One of Us is Lying because I thought the show was fantastic but I highly disliked the book. Let me explain what I liked about the show. The show added so much depth and nuance to all of the characters that the book was sorely lacking and it really strengthened all of their actions and made them so much more believable. Mia is so much more unlikable in the show which I thought was so necessary because she is way too pleasant in the book for Elena to be this suspicious of her and be so like motivated to be out to get her. Izzy was more rebellious like I'm sorry but you don't really go from a harmless prank and an outburst in class to arson. The math ain't mathin. And the added conflict between Mia and Pearl just made things way more realistic. The show just rounded everything out and pulled the whole picture together. I gave this 2.5 stars. The most interesting part of the book was BB's story and the whole custody battle but it takes 120 pages or so to get there in the book. It's funny because this is the third book I've read from Reese Witherspoon's book club and they've all had such similar themes and writing styles and I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Like I'm sure not every book she picks for her book club is that similar. 
but I'm wondering if I just don't like books about motherhood or if it's just specifically books like Little Fires Everywhere and The Whisper Network. I do have a couple more diverse books that center around motherhood to read in the near future, so I guess we will find out. Complete 180, total change of pace, total change of tone. I devoured The Hating Game by Sally Lee Thorne, and someone sent me this and another novel from my Amazon wish list, but they didn't include their at or any information on the note. So if you do send me items from my Amazon wish list, please let me know so I can message you and thank you and tag you in my story or wherever only if you want. I mean the thanking I'm gonna do regardless but let me know if you want me to tag you on like my Instagram story and everything and I will do it. <laughs> This is a new favorite book for me. It has the best sexual tension of any romance book I have read. It is an enemies to lovers workplace romance. There's genuine rivalry, but it's also funny and quirky and cute and sexy. I love Lucy and Josh so much it hurts. I had to like physically stop myself from reading this because I had been reading for hours and I had to make myself put it down because honestly I wanted to savor it more. Guarantee I will be rereading this and it definitely rivals my favorites from Emily Henry. I finished this book and I was like wow I only want to read romance novels for the rest of my life. That is how much of an impact it had on me. I won't be doing that but I will be significantly upping my romance quotient from now on. If you like this genre and you have been sleeping on this book because it's older or you fear it might be overhyped go buy it right now. Oh, and I also did watch the movie adaptation for this as well, and it was really cute. It took out some of the elements that I really liked in the book, but if you're in the mood for like a 2000s-esque rom-com, I would recommend watching it. It was a really fun time. Next, I read The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. Holding this up now, I'm realizing that it has kind of the same vibe as the bodysuit I'm wearing, but this thriller starts when 25 year old Libby learns that she has inherited a mansion from her birth parents. This leads her to discover that when she was an infant she was discovered in a house with three dead bodies and this is the story of how she learns the truth about her birth parents and what really went down in that house. I was really into this book for the majority of it. It felt unique to other thrillers I have read. It essentially focuses on a cult which I was so here for and it feels like it's just building up to something a lot more sinister and then the end just kind of like fizzles out. You could argue that it has a far more realistic ending for books in this genre, like a popcorn thriller this is not. I was just expecting more, but I did really enjoy Lisa Jewell's voice and her writing style, so I will be picking up more books from her in the future. Second to last, I read Tiny Pretty Things by Sona Sharai Potra and Danielle Clayton. I am so sorry if I am butchering those names. I hauled this recently and I mentioned that I picked this up because it is described as Pretty Little Liars meets Black Swan. This takes place at an elite Manhattan ballet school where the students are super cutthroat and will do anything to get to the top. It's compared to Black Swan for obvious reasons but this is a YA teen novel so it's nowhere near as dark or as mind-bending as Black Swan is. This one did feel a little juvenile to me like this is probably the kind of book I would have really enjoyed when I was like 12 years old. Keep in mind I've always been a very advanced reader when I was a kid so I don't know if this would actually be considered age appropriate. This is part of a duology and the end does not wrap anything up. You can't really read this as a standalone and unfortunately I don't think I like this enough to pick up the second book. I would consider it if I saw it on sale for like two dollars maybe but this is like 450 pages. I'm assuming the sequel is the same length so it's kind of a commitment when I was like eh, about it in the first place. My main issue was that the climax of this book is written in such a confusing way. Like the characters have been drinking so it might have been purposeful but I did not know what was happening. Like this isn't what actually happens in the book but as an example imagine you're reading a story and like you feel like you're tracking things and you know what's going on and then in the next chapter someone is like who set off that bomb and you're like wait there was an explosion. <laughs> That's how I felt about this book. I was just so confused. And finally, let's touch on my audiobook pick for the last two months. I listened to The Bassoon King, which is Rain Wilson's memoir. This took me the full two months to get through this nine hour audiobook. I love Rain Wilson. Obviously, I wouldn't have chosen this book if I didn't. 
but I think his narration was just like a little bit too monotone so I had a really difficult time focusing on this one and he also makes a lot of lists in the book which in this case I don't think translated well to the audiobook format. Rain Wilson is hilarious and his life has been very interesting but his book has this kind of air of snobbery to it and he also does talk a lot about his religion which fair enough it is his memoir and obviously his religion has been a huge part of his journey and at the beginning I really didn't mind it because I had never heard of the Baha'i faith before so I was learning something new but it ends up taking up quite a bit of the book and in general I feel like people just don't really like being preached to about other religions you know just saying but if anyone has a recommendation for a highly engaging non-fiction audiobook please let me know in the comments that is going to be it for today's video you guys as always I hope you have enjoyed please give it a thumbs up if you did and don't forget to check out the description box because once again I link absolutely everything I ever mentioned it's all down there easy access for you guys go follow me on social media I'm at Sari Rihanna on Twitter and Instagram subscribe down below if you are new but I will talk to you guys in the next one bye guys